Welcome to uh, TYP Art Cruise, to our art session. Um, today we go on a uh, virtual travel. Um, going to be a bit quick, but I think it's, it's, it will be very interesting. Uh, and um, I put three artworks, well, three images, to give you some indication of where we're going today. Um, there's also a small questionnaire, well, question on the Slido. Uh, actually, I see there are some answers. Let me share it. Ah, it's not that obvious in the end. So, Peru, Australia, South Africa. Got a bit of people vote for different answers. Okay, well, thank you for answering. I suggest that um, we start and uh, Maju, I'll let you record the session. Um, so for those who are busy, they can maybe look at the recordings afterwards. All right, so where are the countries that we're going? Um, I think, well, looking at the answers, there are 40% of you get it right. It is Australia. So we are going to Australia, which is pretty far away. Um, here is France, give you an idea. Okay, so as you, you all know, um, it's a country that is located in the southern hemisphere. So now we are welcoming summer here in Europe and there it's uh, late autumn. The weather start to get cold. Um, it occupies an area, so the continent of 7.6 million square kilometers. Um, so it's huge and it's actually the sixth largest country in the world. However, the population is only rates at 55th um, in the world. So they got only 26 million population. So it's a massive country um, with very uh, diverse landscape. So in the center, there are deserts um, and on the coast, they have either rainforests, but there are also mountain ranges. So it's really like a huge country. And then we have also an island Tasmania which is a bit further away. The fact that, you know, um, Australia is isolated from the rest of the continent pretty early, it means it preserved some, um, well, a certain biodiversity, some animals that went distinct or disappeared on the other continents that we can only find there. So for Australia, a bit history. Um, now we have serious scientific, let's say, proofs that um, there are human presentation um for since well 50,000 or 65,000 years ago however there's also belief that the first two populations so the first two human arrived there around about 100,000 years so it's really a very long history there are a lot of tribes so the original people there um and in 1788 actually there was like a census so according to the study at the time. Um, at the time, there were still 250 tribes there, okay, in Australia in the late 18th century. And each tribe had their own language, own laws or rules, as well as tribal borders. Um, and the Aboriginal population is, was estimated as 300, 350,000 um, at the end of 18th century. So what happened, as we know, is that um, when the Europeans started to do the Grand Tour and discover the world, um, they found all those unknown or new continents. So the first ship actually coming to Australian coast was um, a Dutch navigator uh, in the early 1606. But it's only until 1769 when the famous Captain James Cook um, arrived first in New Zealand and then he arrived in Australia on April 25th, um, 1770. So this is really, you know, like say the, the modern or a new chapter of history of Australia started with the arrival of uh, Captain James Cook. So he arrived there on the um, Botany Bay. So it is really on what, what he called New South Wales. Uh, and you may understand where the name comes from because he's British, so Wales, Wales, South Wales. So he arrived on the coast around Sydney there. Uh, and of course, he claimed that Australia, the eastern half of Australia, belonged to Great Britain. So the British say, OK, now we had a new territory. What are we going to do with that? Uh, let's send uh, the prisoners there. 
So Australia first became actually this part, the Penal Colony. So it was colonized by, um, by Britain, by the British, and it's a Penal Colony. So they sent the prisoners there and that started actually in 1788. So it was really quick. On January the 26th, the captain of the Philip arrived around Sydney with 1,030 people, including 736 prisoners. Today, when you went to go to Sydney, um, they still have this famous play that we can visit called Port Arthur, is to memorize, I'll say, well, um, maybe not in honor, but uh, memorize the historical event. Actually, that starts the modern development of Sydney, which you can see here. Um, and um, uh, if you know a bit at the time, the prisoners who were sent there, they can commit all kinds of crimes, whether it's kill someone, but it can also be very poor people who just stole a bread from a uh, bakery. Um, so th this is really a huge mixture and there are mainly men, but also women. So this is really the start of Australia. And then in the 20th century, January 1st, 1901, it declared um, independence from the British Empire and it became the Australian Federation. So this is very quickly the history. And now we're coming back to this image you have seen at the beginning. We have, well, as you may guess, um, Captain James Cook here. Um, so this is an artwork um, now you can find in the Art Gallery of New South Wales located in Sydney. Uh, it was on the uh, ground floor and um, the statue actually is placed next to the huge windows, give the view to the Sydney Harbour. So I like this photo because it gives you an idea of the scale of this sculpture, right, made out of um, highly polished steel. We can see it's, it's a bit larger than normal human size. Um, the artist was inspired by a famous portrait of James Captain, sorry, um, James Cook, uh, Captain Cook that was painted in 1776. So it's a very, very nice um, post with the uh, um, coat, um, the, the floating top coat and then the ponytail as the fashion at the time. However, uh, look at, well, he, he's sort of standing on a, on a table, well, sorry, sitting on the table. Uh, and what the artist want to convey here by, sorry, by placing him here is, you know, the world has changed, right? Um, two and a half centuries, Later, um, if James Cook is still here looking at Sydney Harbour, he gonna probably reflect on the changes that he has brought to the world by discovering a new continent, by bringing the British to claim it, you know, claim it as the British colony. So this is a bit um, more like a reflection mode that the artist who want us bring the audience to, to think about. It's the whole heritage that he has left on the world, in the world, and of course at the time he was not aware of that. So interestingly about this artist, Michael Perico Hai, um, he's actually from New Zealand and he has descent actually um, roots from both the Maori, um, the, the New Zealand Aboriginal people, as well as European ancestors. Um, and the art gallery actually ordered this work from him um, to be completed actually in 2015. The fabrication of this work, it's actually take place, it actually took place in China, um, considering the size. So uh, it was actually the steel were fabricated in China, in the Guangdong province, and then they were sending pieces to Sydney and they assembled actually in the museum. So I find it's really interesting because it's a look back to the history, reminding us, you know, all those explorations, um, not only Captain Cook, but all the other Europeans have done. Uh, and then they start a new chapter about colonization, whatever you call that. Uh, and today we're in a globalization world. So an artwork here representing a British figure discovered Australia was actually manufactured um, in China and uh, following the design of a New Zealand artist. So, so we are really like, you know, connecting the different dots of the history. So when the British discover um, Australia, it was still in the tribal mode. Um, and for the or Aboriginal people, actually, they, they live in the nature. They have a very strong tie with the nature. And things changed 
with the uh, European survival, as you would imagine. So here on, on the screen, the large painting um, is a sort of landscape painting, a bit in the exotic way, which is called Natives on the Oos River uh, in the Van Diemen's Land, painted by John Glover. So John Glover um, was an English artist. He was born in 1767 in England. And then he arrived in Australia in 1831 at the age of 61 years old. So as you can imagine, at the time, right, people did not live that long. So um, he, he was already a very successful artist. And I guess he was pretty ambitious, still very curious at the senior age. So he said, OK, let me go to the new continent. And then I can paint and I show it, you know, to the people in England, how Australia or this new land of the Brit belonging to the British Empire, how does it look like? Because at the time we don't have photographs. The only way is make drawings or paintings. So people from further away can imagine how the country looked like. And Glover was already a um, very successful artist at the time in England, uh, notably famous for the landscape in the classic way, um, especially as you can see here, it's a um, painting by a French artist um, called Le Lohan. Um, and uh, Glover was um, very inspired or belonging to the school of classical landscape, um, you know, have this countryside very idyllic. And this is how he captured Australia. It's interesting to look at the trees, the rivers and this branch. Um, and you can see, you know, the, the natives or the Aboriginal people there. So it's really like an idyllic image of an untouched land um, not polluted, you know, by the art commerce um, or the culture or or those industrialization, capitalism from the Europe. However, sadly, this was not the case at all um, because the place, so this river or the land that we are looking at on the painting, um, the tribe who live there, they are the uh, Brouwenian people, so um, of the big river tribe. Unfortunately, um, with the arrival of the colonists, their land was took away and they were treated with violence by the colonists. So behind the painting, unfortunately, there's the sad history. And if we're moving forward, um, here is an artwork, contemporary artwork that I discovered in Australia. Um, I think it was uh, near some walking tracks around Sydney. Uh, and I find it's very interesting. So you can walk around like this forest. And as you can see, we have these buttons, right? Round, round buttons or motifs that are putting on different trees. So unfortunately, I cannot find back the artist's name. Um, but I want to share it with you because um, it's, I find it's, it's really, how to say, um, alarming. Um, so what presented here is actually every round symbol you see, it represents a disappeared species. Um, so since 1788, so since the arrival of the uh, Europeans, of the British, um, there are a lot of indigenous species has disappeared, um, including four type of frogs, 22 type of birds, 27 types of mammals and 37 of plants and furthermore. So the artist actually designed this round button pattern with different colors and size to representing all those disappeared species. And by placing them in the nature on the tree that probably refers to the birds or somewhere else, it, it reminds us, you know, how Australia used to be um, with a large biodiversity um, a harmony between the animals, um, plants, um, vegetations with people. And unfortunately, this has been destroyed. And uh, I find it's, it's very alarming. And even if in Europe or in the worldwide, looking at the climate change or the environmental crisis that we live through, um, it's, it's a very beautiful artwork, I find. So now, coming back to the history um, or to Australia, uh, we all know it's famous for farming, um, having cows, sheep, etc. And it produced a lot of dairy products. Uh, and uh, as you may know too, um, as it's a British colony, it heritated a lot of like the British culture, uh, lifestyle, including the beautiful countryside. 
So here we have a painting by an artist called Elio Gruner um, from early 20th century. Um, it's a very beautiful painting showing uh, a farm with a sheep um, and the name is Spring Frost. So we're in the springtime in, in Australia and what I find really beautiful with this painting is the light, right? We can see the light and the tone uh, and as you may guess, um, this artist, he was influenced by the painting of plein air or impressionist, um, which was very popular or in France, especially started in France in the late 19th century. So Gruner, he was actually born in New Zealand, but he went to Australia at the age of one, well, one years old, together with his parents. He visited the UK between 1924 and 1925. Um, and spend the rest of the year in, in Australia in Sydney. Um, this is one of his masterpiece and received the prize, of course, as you would imagine. So he was really attracted to this plein air or painting open air approach. As you know, in the 19th century, right, the artists, they refused to paint in their studio alone. So they want to go out in nature and try to capture the light, capture the beautiful color. And this gave the birth actually to Impressionism. So um, Gruner one did the same, and it was not that simple because um, this painting, he was made it in Emu Plains, which is about 60 kilometers west from uh, Sydney Centre. Um, he built up actually a, a structure to protect the large-sized canvas. Um, on the screen, we don't see it, but it's actually quite a big, large painting. Uh, because it's open air, so he had to have like a workshop to protect his canvas you know from the bad weather and more interestingly as the title said it's spring frost so it's still pretty cold in the morning at the time and to paint outside he had to actually wrap his feet with cheerful bags to avoid frostbite so he did not get you know hurt with the uh, with the cold so as you can imagine the life of an artist or a painter is not that always comfortable um it's pretty hard uh, so he did all the sketches and in the end he finalized the painting in his workshop. Now we move forward. Um, as I mentioned, you know, um, Gruner, he studied art, he visited the UK and he was influenced by the 19th century artists in Europe, especially the French one. So at the time, late 19th century, early 20th century, France is really the dream art world or the art stage, especially Paris, for everyone. So a lot of Australian artists, they will go to Europe for the tour and especially go to France. So here we have two paintings from a couple. Um, we have on the left side, um, Phillips Fox. So he was born in Melbourne and he spent eight years in France. Um, mainly stayed in Paris, um, but he loved Trouville. Uh, so he went to Trouville and Deauville regularly. He got to make a quick sketch outdoors and then came back to Paris to finalize them. That's why here we have this the ferry, the painting, that he was capturing, you know, this beautiful lady is going onto a boat um, in Trouville. So he took a view like as audience, you know, we, we were maybe on a bridge or somewhere higher, peering down into this group and, and look at the fashion, the umbrellas they have, the way they dressed up, you know, beautiful hat with the veils as well as the pattern on the dresses. So it's a very beautiful painting. Um, so, so this painting it actually went back to Australia and was exhibited in Sydney in 1913. And Fox, he actually influenced a whole young generation of artists in Australia. So those younger generation who was not able to made to um, France or Europe, they took a lot from Fox, as well as um, his um, wife, um, Isel Carrick. So here, um, they also went to Brittany, and I put this painting high tide at Saint Malo. I guess those who have been to Saint Malo going to recognize, you know, um, this huge fortress by the uh, by the beach, and it's really impressive. And we have this small cabinet where you can go and change your clothes, which is still the case today. Um, so yes, the, the Australian artists, they, they went to Europe, they learned, um, you know, the, the, the most advanced the techniques, um, the art movements, the art series, 
and then they came back and they also want to find their own way and they look at their own life in Australia. So here I wanted to introduce you to a uh, woman artist whose name is uh, Florence Fuller. Um, I, I love a lot her works, especially this one that is called Weary. What we see is a poor boy, young boy, probably like a homeless boy who's sleeping in the street next to the wall. And on the wall, we can see all those um, posters um, about trade and commerce. So this actually take place, took place in Melbourne. So Fula, she lived in Melbourne and behind the painting, you know, we can capture the things of, of, the, the, of the port of, you know, and she really put her regard instead of the, um, her look, instead of to the beautiful landscape, she actually put her look into the, the daily life, um, especially the poverty. So the subject of urban poverty, it was actually pretty popular in the uh, art of the Victorian period in England. However, in Australia, it was very rare. It, it's exceptional in the same period. So I think it's, it's really great to see this and reminding us what happening there. Um, of course, the country was flourishing, but there was also poverty. Uh, and what's beautiful is, you know, with the, the paint brush that we can feel, look at the face of this young boy who was exhausted. Um, we, we don't know, you know, what, what he lived through. Uh, and I find it's very touching. And it actually reminded me of another beautiful painting that's from the 17th century, um, painted by a Spanish artist called Murillo that I put on the right side. You can actually find it in Louvre Museum. Um, it's the same subject. So uh, Murillo, he explored or portrayed, you know, a young beggar. And we have this beautiful light that is coming from the windows. So, both of them, are, I find it's, it's very beautiful that I want to share with you. And moving forward, um, Australia, move forward together with the world, um, with the modernism. Um, so here we have another um, very important artist in Australia art history, whose name is Grace Cossington Smith. Um, so she's, um, she's actually recognized as the first modernism uh, artist of the Australia. She studied art in England um, and then also go back to Italy a bit later. Uh, and, and that's where she absorbed, discovered those avant-garde, um, especially the, the painting by Cezanne, again, the French artist, the sort of influenced the world. And she took that back to Australia. Here, what she captured is um, the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I put a photo that I, that I took back into uh, 2019, and we have this beautiful Sydney Harbour, you know, with the Opera House as well as the bridge. So the bridge was completed in 1932. Uh, now it's a world-known symbol of Sydney, and itself is also a work um, from the modernism because of its shape and the material it used. Um, and uh, um, Grace Cossington Smith, he managed to capture the bridge during its construction uh, in 1928-29, so before it's, it's um, getting ready. Uh, and you can still see those construction works here um, with the huge, massive iron structure that they put up. Actually, this is still pretty the case today. If you go to Sydney, uh, you can still find this angle where the artist painted it. So we can feel the modernism for, for the artist, for Grace Cossington Smith, it's not only in how you paint the painting, but it's also in the subject. And what's better than the new Sydney Harbour Bridge as the subject for modernism? So we can feel the energy, right, of the, um, of the modern engineering, of the modern times, as well as the hope that the artist placed in the modern era. Everything is changing and we're going to open a new chapter of the history. Um, and still stay in the Sydney Harbour. Um, as you can see, we have a very different painting here. So we had the uh, Sydney Bridge on the um, on top left side here, but this is shown in a very, let's say, more abstract way. So here, let's meet Brett Whitley, um, who is one of the most important artists of Australia, and it's really like the pride of Australia. Um, he lived in Sydney. He visited actually Europe and did a walk tour in the 1960s. Um, but his beloved country remains Australia. 
actually during his trip, he, he enjoyed a lot. But in the end, he was so um, he was so such in a hurry to go back to his own country and find back Sydney. Uh, so today, um, his workshop is a museum and it's open for public visit. So here is a view of Sydney Harbour that the artist painted from um, his workshop, uh, which is a bit um, on the hill, give a, a very beautiful view. And this blue that you see on the screen, it is the famous whitely blue um, with this tone and we can feel right somewhere there's the reflection and some part of the blue is a bit darker. And I really like, you know, his style. It feels so light and it transforms the view of Sydney Harbour as we can see here into a more abstract way. And maybe you, you can recognize there's something similar with Matisse because Whiteley during his travel in Europe, he, he loved Matisse. And I think he tried to incorporate some of the elements that Matisse bears um, into his painting. So here we have this Venetian um, balcony. Interestingly, this balcony did not in, exist when artists made this painting. Uh, and today it's back because after he passed away, his wife actually added this um, balcony, a bit based on the painting he did, to their home, to their to the museum today. Um, but it's maybe interesting to bring, you know, like a European element into here, reminding I don't know the viewers of the past of um, of Australia, or uh, referring to you know the the grand art period or maybe Brightly himself, Whiteley himself, want to compete with those older masters. And one more details to share with you. You may notice we have this a bit weird object here, and the form is sort of also um, close or similar to the, uh, to the shape on this Venetian balcony. So this is actually, um, according to the study, well, actually we know, um, it's a um, motif that repeated that was repetitive in the artist painting. Um, it actually refers to the female body, the, the bottom, as you can imagine. So Whiteley he did also a lot of portraits, especially female nude portrait, using his wife as a model. Uh, and in his nude paintings, um, he would always presented the body of his wife in this way. Uh, and here he added it here, so it's interesting. Like, okay, um, what, what's the link? And I think that's a question that artists left us to, to explore or to think. But this is really a very beautiful painting and it's huge, measuring over um, three meters and two meters high. So very impressive. And to end today's session, sorry, I know we are running a bit out of time, um, but there's so much to share with you uh, in this short journey. Uh, so we are in Australia and we can't talk about Australian art without you know, mentioning the Aboriginal art. So as I said, there are tribes in Australia for at least 65,000 years or even 100,000 years. The uh, Aboriginal people, um, they don't keep writing. So they pass on to their knowledge via oral singing, oral songs. And for them, it's super important to live in harmony with the land. There's really like a spiritual relation with the land. Uh, I remember I, I did a tour and uh, the guide was actually belonged to one of the tribe. He said that their mindset is, you know, if you took something from the nature, you need to give back. Um, so that's very different from the modern way, how we explore or deploying the world resources. Um, but anyway, coming back here, we have really like the Aboriginal um, typical art. So what we see here, actually, the, the, the different um, patterns, the, the shapes, if you took a close look, they were actually formed by dots. You see, it's always the little dots that formed all these um, patterns. So all of these um, artworks, they are made with uh, natural materials. Again, it's the link um, between the nature and human. So these are fiber artworks um, and they form these circles and lines. So there are a lot of experts studying them. They believe these dots were used to hide some secret symbols that represent the secret knowledge of the Aboriginal people. Uh, as I said, they don't have writing, so there may be a way, you know, they want to pass on some secret knowledge about the spirituals or uh, other things with the, the, the relation with the land, the secret. However, unfortunately, these got lost. Um, but it's really beautiful to look at that because they really have a sense of very unique abstract art. But what I like particular is that uh, it also reminds me of the natural landscape.
because if you go to the desert and if you look onto the sky, you will see that the stars look like the round and in the desert, we do have this landscape. So is it also a, a projection, you know, of what they see and where they live? That's the question. And this Aboriginal art, they kept getting renewed um, still by the uh, artist today by introducing more color. As you can see, here is a more modern version. And I also put a, a very mask, uh, uh, interesting mask um, to you. Uh, you can see they use these shells and, and the form they perform, which is really close to the art. So it's between abstract and um, representative so it's very their unique world i find the mask is really beautiful and of course it's um, only used during spiritual ceremony and to finish i select this work which is called judgment day by richard bell uh, which says australian art does not exist so richard bell um, is an aboriginal artist um, belongs to you know several tribes and uh, um, he is also an activist. So what's interesting I found on this painting is, you see, we find back on um, these circles and these lines that recall the original art. However, there are also dripping of paints, which remind me of the uh, um, action painting that's um, you know, led, led by Jackson Pollock. So the American abstract artist and you know, really leading this way to he throw paint onto the canvas and made those abstract paintings full of action and energy. So this strip of painting, um, reminding us of the action expressionism, sorry, abstract ex expressionism from Jackson Pollock, which show also there are Western influences in the Australian art. Uh, in the end, Australian art does not exist does it or does not? So that's a question to the audience. And I, for, for my I understanding this way is if you look at Australian history, it's so rich, right? And uh, um, we usually focus when the British, when the English or, or the Europeans arrived. Um, and we have seen all those generations of artists, they drew their inspiration, they learn from the European art, but they also have a very rich heritage. So it's constantly a question of about how to place their art or find their identity. What is actually being a true Australian? Is it European? Is it Aboriginal? Or in the 21st century, maybe it's something else. So that is really the message I think the artists want to deliver and make us think. So, well, here comes to the end of our session today. Um, it's very hard to find Australian art actually uh, in France or in Europe. That's why I decided also to do this presentation to get you into a, a bit of this world. Um, you can go to actually Musée du Quai Branly, um, which have a uh, very interesting collection of the Oceania art. So it, it not only from Australia, but it's the whole group actually of different islands um, from the south of Malaysia onto the limits of South Pacific because back into um, the long history, we believe the humans, they actually started from the Southeast to Cape Ocean, um, Asian coast. So like Malaysia, Indonesia, and then they set home to the boat. I find it's extremely brave that you go into the, explore the ocean, endless. And then that's how they arrived um, in Polynesia, um, Philippines, Australia, um, all those parts. So you can go to um, Musée de Gabonli to discover this um, collections. And uh, at the Musée uh, d'Orsay, there are also a couple of Impressionist paintings that were made by the Australian artist during their stay in France. Um, so if ever you go there, maybe pay attention, you can have some surprise. So um, here it is. I hope you enjoying uh, today's session. Uh, if you love art and uh, want to discover more, you can always follow my blog on, on Instagram, which is called uh, TYP Art Cruise. I want to thank you all for your, for your time and for your interest today. Uh, as always, if you have any question, uh, don't hesitate. You can contact me by email or on Instagram. And uh, have a beautiful day. Uh, enjoy this great time and especially the, uh, the long weekend. And I look forward to see you in June for something very different. <laughs>